Hey everybody, I'm Ted Price from Insomniac Games. On today's episode of the Game Maker's Notebook, I had the pleasure of interviewing Joseph Staten. He's the Senior Creative Director at Microsoft. He's writer and creative lead for all the major Halo titles, head of creative for Halo Infinite at 343 Industries, and he's a published author. And I'm probably making Joseph uncomfortable by listing so many accolades, but he really deserves it. He's been instrumental in driving one of the most venerated franchises in our industry. And as you might have guessed, we talked about Halo, and of course, we talked about Halo Infinite. Joseph shared his thoughts on how and why Halo has had such broad appeal over the decades. He described how the 343 team has tackled the challenges of both supporting an evolving campaign and a live services game. And he shared lots of excellent advice for designers, creative leads, and writers. Please join us. Joseph, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ted. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm so glad to be able to talk to somebody who has been an instrumental part of one of the franchises that I've loved forever. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd love to go back to the beginning and just ask, how did you get started in games? Oh, well, first, that's very kind of you to say that about me and, and Halo. Um, after 20 years, uh, it's been a big part of my life. Too. Now, I wasn't there for all the 20 years of Halo, but uh, for many of them, I was. So, yeah, means means a lot to me as well. How did I get started? Well, uh, I did not go to school for video games. Back when I was uh, growing up, and maybe true for you as well, like video games wasn't really a career choice, or at least you couldn't major in video game design um, when I went to school. So I went to college and grad school thinking I was going to be in uh, the Foreign Service or work in a think tank or work somewhere in the realm of international relations. Um, to take a step back, I did go to undergrad thinking I was going to be a theater major and ended up uh, realizing that what I really loved was writing, creative writing, uh, the playwriting side and text analysis of, of, of theater uh, and ended up getting a, a degree in communication studies, international relations, and went on to grad school for international relations stuff. Uh, but the whole time that I was getting an education and even younger, I was a video game player. I was a gamer. I loved playing games. Started off with tabletop games and board games and uh, video games in the 80s and 90s. And uh, 
after I graduated from grad school and was waiting for to get a job, uh, I fell in with a little company in Chicago called Bungie because I love playing this game called Myth and got to know the guys making the game because I played online against them and happened to have a, a college connection with one of the people that worked for Bungie. And they said, hey, what are you what are you doing? Didn't you get like some degree in international business or something? And I said, yes. Um, and I went to help them lead their international business licensing stuff. So uh, long story short, you got to jam your foot in the door uh, any way you any way you can, even though you don't exactly get the degree on your resume that's totally appropriate for the role. Um, but uh, not to be really clear, I didn't lie on my resume. <laughs> I just, yes. Uh, but yeah, I mean, joking aside, that's how I how I got into the business. I came in on the publishing side of things, doing international licensing, and uh, because Bungie had a publishing team back in the day in Chicago before the Microsoft acquisition, and uh, yeah, helped out with localization. And you know, in the first year or so, they said, uh, "Didn't you also go to school and get some like creative writing sort of screenwriting degree?" And I said, "Yeah, and I can I can write screenplays. I love storytelling." And I started to move more into the narrative design side of the fence, and you know, been, you know, doing things like that, moving on to creative direction ever since. So, yeah, I mean, that's the really brief story about how I got involved in, in games. And I mean, you know how it was back in the day with small teams, like you had to wear a lot of hats and yep. do a lot of different things. And so being kind of a jack of all trades or Jill of all trades is like, it was, was really, really useful on small video game teams back, back then. And uh, it just ended up working out. When you started, yeah. And when, when all when most of us who are our age started in the video yeah. game business, really video game writers weren't it wasn't really an official job for, for a lot of companies. And yeah. most of us were sort of under trying to learn on the fly. So with no rule book and no yeah. no others to look at, how did what were the rules that you established for yeah. narrative design and writing? Well, yeah, no, that's that's great because uh, I don't think we called it narrative design back in the day. We certainly called it writing. We called it cinematic direction. And my entry point was really starting with what I knew at that point, which was really film techniques, um, mm -hmm. cinematic storytelling techniques. We knew that we wanted to tell a big epic sci-fi story with Halo. So for us, cinematics were a natural part of telling that story. We could look at, you know, big franchises, big movies that inspired us from Star Wars to Blade Runner to Aliens to, you know, you name it. And for us, that felt like the the right match of a language we understood, a storytelling style we understood with the ambition that we had for the game. So from a writing point of view, um, I certainly knew how to write film scripts. I'd written them before. Uh, that was part of my my training. So that was my that was my entry point. I said, OK, well, let's let's start. Um, writing these scripts, let's get a spine of the story together. But one lesson I learned really early on, which turned into a rule pretty quickly, was uh, unlike a film script where you're going to lock it and you're going to storyboard it and you're going to shoot it, the audience doesn't have any agency, right? They, they're not going to run around your film and uh, shoot up the sets and do a bunch of stuff and move the props around. Like that The whole agency part of cinematic storytelling, it's, it's very different in video games, of course. So I learned very early on that for as long as possible, we needed to keep that cinematic spine, that story spine, as flexible as possible. As we learned about the game, found the fun, uh, went on our own learning journey as a studio uh, with user research as we joined Microsoft and got a lot of like player feedback at a much earlier stage than we ever had for, for a Bungie game. All of that meant as the writer, as the story guy, that flexibility was a, a main rule. That was rule number one. Um, rule number two really ended up being to try to make the player feel as involved with the story that we were telling as that moment to moment gameplay. You know, Halo, as we developed the game, we realized its special sauce was letting the player feel like the most powerful actor in this rich, emergent physical simulation. You would scavenge the battlefield and you would pick up guns, right? You would exchange them out. It was very, very fluid. And so when it came to cinematics, this might seem like kind of a small thing, but for us, it was really, really painful to think about, well, you go into a cinematic, I was just using the needler and then I show up in the cinematic with an assault rifle. Like that breaks, that breaks the connection between the player in the story and the player in the experience. So a small example, but an important rule, we wanted to make sure that you brought your own gun to the story. That became a rule, bring your own gun, BYOG. And that led us down this path of real time cinematics because that was the only way that we can really have the player, uh, you know, carry that weapon. We also realized the players love to do like, 
throw parts of our physics sandbox into a cinematic set and watch like an AI pop into frame or like fly a ghost into the, into the cinematic. We embraced all those um, parts of this simulation combat game, the sandbox combat game and real time cinematics allowed us to, to let that gameplay bleed, bleed into the storytelling experience. So just a couple examples of those rules that we, that we ended up building on the fly. I mean, like you said, we were all, we were all learning and, and learning as we went. That's, those are great examples. I do remember playing Combat Evolved and actually a bunch of us analyzing Combat Evolved at Insomniac mm-hmm. and going, oh, look, at, look at this, the weapon, yeah. there is real time. And yeah. it was really yeah. nice to see that, that move away from pre-rendered cinematics. Yeah. Uh, and, and you all, I think, st- uh, either started that trend or certainly accelerated that trend, uh, yeah. for sure. Yeah, it was terrifying too. I mean, one of the things I still lose sleep over if I think about it too much is because everything was real time, it goes at a very, very small team. I think we only had one, maybe two animators on the whole on the whole project. So a lot of the game relied on playback animations. You know, you would jump in, you would move the characters around, you would go back in and while watching that playback play, you would start moving another character and you'd build cinematics up basically by driving characters and vehicles with your mouse and keyboard and the game was just recording input and uh, playing that input back. Wow. Uh, late in development, we changed the way physics worked. And I remember one of the engineers coming to me one day and he said, so how bad would it be for the cinematics if we changed all the Pelican physics and broke all your playback animations? <laughs> and I think he saw like the blood drain from my face. Um, and he said, yeah, I guess we're not gonna, not gonna do that. Like changes like that would have been catastrophic. Um, and so as much as we enjoyed that real-time cinematic approach and it gave us the flexibility, that player connection we're talking about, it was also fraught with peril. So it was a it was a learning experience um, where there were painful moments, painful moments too. But yeah, it's 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 great to hear that you guys took a look at it at Insomniac and uh, um, that's that's fun. Well, I'll get back to that because we looked at a bunch okay. of other stuff too, which we really appreciated and we learned yeah. from. But, but I, Given we're still in the way back machine, yeah, I'm gonna ask you a tough question. So, in three words, can you okay. describe how the Halo team has changed from then on the Combat Evolved to now? Mm, okay, well, the first word is easy. That's just size. Okay, um, I think the first Halo team was uh, I'll get the numbers wrong, but you know, between 50 and 100 people. If we thought about the whole team, including test and marketing, and what it took to you know, localization, bring the game to market. But the core team is right around 50-ish or so so people. Okay. Uh, Halo Infinite is 500 plus people. So, you know, a, a massive a massive increase in the total number of people. Yeah. Um, the second word, I guess, would have to be, and this is true for a lot of people, so not surprisingly, but like, I guess I'll say fidelity. Like if you look at that first Halo game, we all went through the, you know, HD era where we upgraded everything to HD and then we just continued to double down on on fidelity of experience. And I don't just mean graphical fidelity. I mean, you know, fidelity broadly, broadly speaking, where the player expectation for world depth, um, detail across the board has just increased significantly over the years. Um, and of course that's had an impact on team size. Um, And maybe the third word, this is hard because I'll bet I'll regret using this word, but it's the one that springs to mind is ambition. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say the ambition of the Halo 1 team was small by by no means. Like uh, there was a lot of ego and ambition on that on that team. And we were we were hungry to make a to make a mark for sure. But I mean, ambition in terms of the breadth of experiences that we now deliver as Halo Infinite. You know, Halo 1 had a campaign. You could play it cooperatively. It also had multiplayer, mm-hmm. um, but over the years we've added things like Forge, right? Our UGC content creation tool. Um, we are now a service, you know, uh, trying to deliver on a regular cadence, really exciting, innovative, engaging, you know, experiences to players. Halo now has this massive franchise business, consumer products. There's a television show, etc., uh, etc., cetera, etc. Et when I pull back and look at the Halo franchise, not just the game that um, ambition is just become so much larger over the years. And with it comes increased burden too, um, of trying to be AAA, be successful across a much broader area of experiences. It definitely, you know, brings challenges with it for sure. 
So what did I say? I said uh, size and fidelity and ambition. Yep. Um, I don't know. Three words. That, that's I'll, great. I'll, I'll stick with those three words. I love it. I love it. And that's that makes a lot of sense having yeah. for me having played Halo Infinite and you know, playing it. I, I, I'll get to this in a, in a while, but I really do feel such a connection back to the first few games, too. It does. Yeah. But then when I go back and look at the first games, yeah, it really has come a long way. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. you, one thing you said that struck me is that you talked about making a mark and, and you all, your team has made such a mark on pop culture. I mean, you've, you've been creating Halo lore for over 20 years. Yeah. Master Chief, uh, The Covenant, Cortana, they become household names. Really, I mean, you see, I hear people outside of games talking about them all the time, and obviously with the TV show, that helps too. Yeah. So my question for you is, what's been the key to longevity for for the characters and for the lore, and why does it stick with people? Because there are plenty of games yeah. that have been, or franchises that have been around that haven't had that same stickiness. That's a really good question. Um, well, let me start with the game itself because halo halo is just fun to play and i know when designers say fun we get into words like mastery and competence and all these kinds of things but like it's just it's fun and it's especially fun to play with friends you know halo's always been a game that you could play together whether you were cooperating with your friends or like competing you know aggressively against your friends it was a shared experience from day day one and that built a community. And at the heart of Halo really is this community of players who love spending time together in this, and this is the second part, this deep sci-fi world together. I mean, science fiction endures as a genre for all the you know reasons I, I think we under, understand about it. it, speaks to human aspiration and hope and you know heroism in the black depths of space, like all these things that make sci-fi tick as a genre is true in Halo as well. And that strong feeling of being a hero, um, a hero that can you know face impossible odds, um, you know work on their feet, uh, put together a plan on the fly. Uh, it just feels good to play Halo with friends, and I think it especially feels good to be the Master Chief, to mm -hmm. be that kind of to be that kind of hero. Um, and so that I think is really at the the heart of why Halo has endured. It's a deep, hopeful sci-fi world that's fun to jump in and experience with your with your friends and beyond games you know there are now thankfully lots of other ways for people to jump in and experience halo 2 i mean there's a television show of course there's you know, a series of books you can read there's all kinds of beautiful art i mean it, there are lots of engagement points for for lots of different people and you don't have to be a you know sweaty competitive multiplayer player to enjoy <laughs> halo and i think that's really important for bright big franchises to to endure um yeah. You know, you want to you want to become almost like a hobby where that has these activities for any kind of mood, lots of different ways for people to in, to engage. And uh, I think Halo has gone a long way over 20 years to to achieving that for sure. Yeah, you're um, right. It really has spread out. I mean, spread yeah. spread its wings in, in a big way. But it does come back to Master Chief pretty much over and over again. And yeah. one as as a writer. Right. Yeah. I think you have shown and the team has shown admirable restraint with <laughs> Master Chief. And the question is, have you ever been tempted to take Master Chief in different directions? Oh, I've been tempted. Um, and I've, I've executed on that temptation, which is to say, in Halo 2 specifically, um, as a writer, at the end of Halo 1, I, for, for a variety of reasons that we can get into, I felt like Master Chief had limitations and that if we wanted to tell a deeper story to expand our world that for me at that time, Master Chief was the least interesting character in the Halo <laughs> universe. He really was because I felt like through a combination of technology and, um, you know, the choices we'd made about, uh, you know, keeping his face masked. And uh, I just was, I guess, in a moment of not crisis as a writer, but I was just kind of pulling my hair out and saying like, what can we, what can we do with this character? Like we want to go on and tell this, tell a deeper, more involved story. And for me, I just latched onto the idea of the most interesting player, the most interesting character in the Halo universe at that time wasn't the Master Chief. It was in fact the character who had been beaten by the Master Chief. Like for me, that was the more interesting characters. You've got this, this hero who cut a 
bloody swath through the covenant. Who's the most interesting character? Like the one to the covenant blamed for that disaster. And that's where the Arbiter um, came into being. And through Halo 2, I guess I kind of fell back in love with the Master Chief because what I realized as a writer, um, and I think as a writer, as a creative person, you always like remember lessons again that you should have known but forgot. Like the lesson I relearned was that, not surprisingly, in a story, like conflict is really important. And you need the reason why I was upset with the Master Chief or thought he was the least interesting character in the Halo universe is we'd never put up something in opposition to him from a story point of view that ever felt like a real dramatic blocker for the Master Chief or a character that could be an equal partner in this dramatic conflict relationship. And with the creation of Arbiter, well, then finally for me, I, as a writer, I began to feel like, oh, this is clicking now. There's real dramatic opposition here and there's a different point of view. And there's a, you know, a villain who is not really a villain that has his own reasons for acting the way that he did. And so then, then everything just started working. And so the other lesson I learned from that is that, um, and this is just something that's, I guess, a, either a weakness or a strength of me as a writer is I always, I really enjoy different perspectives on storytelling. I really just enjoy looking at singular events from multiple points of view. Um, you can see this in Halo ODST. You can see this in some of the other stuff that I've done, but that's a lesson that I really learned starting with um, Halo 2 is that a great way to expand the sci-fi universe is to keep the Master Chief as the heart of it, as that stalwart, hopeful heart, but then surround him with this wider, constellation of really diverse characters that all have their own unique perspective on this master chief story if that if that makes sense um anyways i can go on and on about this but uh yeah that's uh, i think an answer to the question you asked it i is. forgot the question you, you asked no it, it is and you can see that running all the way through halo yeah. infinite now and it's 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 been so much as a player fun to come back to mm -hmm. halo again and feel like i know master chief really well you haven't you haven't messed with with him or the formula and so as a result i feel the same connection the deep connection i've always had because he is as a player he's me i'm him and it's it's right. it's great yeah so i i want to talk about your transition as well though yep. from from writer to head of creative so you are head of creative at 343 now and That's you came right. in right to halo infinite what what is what's different about your job today than it was on the previous halos uh let's see well um, as I mentioned before, there's a, there's a size and ambition, uh, in Halo these days that is, that is different. And again, it's not like we lacked ambition or we're not pushing the envelope for size, um, back in the day, but really I was much more focused on, um, the gameplay experience for a specific product for a specific mm -hmm. game release. Now as head of creative, um, it's my job to look after all the game experiences that we that we make um we've got other great uh, creative folks looking after the franchise side of things kiki wolf kill and frank o'connor and everybody on the on the franchise side so my head of creative role is really focused on the, the gameplay the interactive uh, part of the stuff that we that we do but that means that i'm looking after not only uh campaign experiences uh but also our free-to-play multiplayer experiences as well the stuff that we've got you know up and running today, the players can play. And of course, stuff that we're working on behind the scenes, uh, the next evolution in, in multiplayer and campaign as well. So a lot of different teams working on a lot of different stuff that each have their own dedicated creative sets of leaders, but it's my job to keep them, you know, coordinated and have a good consistent vision and make sure we're all, we're all walking in the same direction, even if we're on slightly different, slightly different paths. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's in short, it, it's a creative director job, but it's really a creative director job across multiple multiple experiences. Okay. So mechanically, that sounds very challenging. What, what are the ways that you keep communication flowing freely between all the different groups who are responsible for different features for live services versus campaign? Yeah. What do you, what do you, what's your technique? Yeah. Um, and how do you do that in two years of pandemic work from home? And it's been, I'm sure I know for all of us, a, a real, a real challenge. So this may seem like an, an evasive answer, Ted, but I, but I really, mean it like the way that i survive in my job is to make sure that we've got other great leaders on the team like there's no way there's no way to be successful in any leadership role without other great leaders to 
to work alongside you, support that the work that you're doing, um, help you see your blind spots, hold you accountable, uh, all those all those kinds of things. So step one is making sure that each of those teams has has great leaders that are really focused in on exactly what that particular experience needs. I mean, I know as a as a fellow leader, like focus is just so important. And so the way I avoid being spread too thin and not having that focus time when I need it is to make sure that there are other leaders working with me who have that laser laser focus time for what they're doing. Um, I will say that, you know, quite frankly, I don't have all the answers figured out because Halo is doing something it's never really done before, which is run a, a real robust live service. Now it's true, like Master Chief Collection, which is amazing, has been running seasons for quite some time. Like we built a lot of great muscle on the Master Chief side of the fence, um, but we've never done free to play live service before. And that's a different, that's a very different situation as, as you know. And so figuring out how to keep coordination as we move into this world where now free to play multiplayer is on a different track than let's say our next campaign experience you know, we launched Infinite, all planes landed on the runway at the exact same time, pretty much. We launched our campaign, we launched our free-to-play multiplayer. So it was really easy to, not easy, it was more straightforward to keep the team directed toward this one moment in time where we had to land all these things. So just for example, when we were running Central Triage, like all the experienced teams were in that meeting, right? We used that as a place to coordinate, make sure everybody was on the same page. Well, now that those touch points aren't as closely connected. We're we're on different paths, right? Like I said, toward toward this common goal. So I don't know. I mean, I I learn something new every day. And we're trying a whole bunch of new things inside the studio to to get ourselves better coordinate, better coordinated. But um, the principle I keep coming back to is if I've got a strong set of leads that are working alongside me and I am able to give them clarity about what our goals are um, and have the cycles to respond as needed to things that come up that are open questions like that solves a, a big part of the a big part of the problem where i run into trouble as a leader is where i'm spread too thin i'm not properly delegating um and like i'm not i'm not being aggressive about going towards like simple crisp clarity about what's important um so but yeah i i i, I like i said continue to learn every day about all this because it's well, it's tough that's an interesting, I mean, what you just described is, is a great sort of checklist of, of things to, to mm -hmm. watch out for, but do you check yourself on that or do people check you? Uh, I would like to think that I am my own worst uh, critic or most aggressive critic. Um, I do have a really um, high standard and I'll, I'll give you one example of this. Um, and I work in Halo, as you know, since the very beginning, I worked in it for more than 10 years, I took a break. And when I thought about coming back, I thought long and hard about like, what, is that, what does that mean to come back to Halo for me in this role that's got a lot of scope and a lot of responsibility. And where I landed was I'm, I'm coming back to Halo to serve a franchise that I love and be a voice for the players who love this franchise as much as, as, much as I do. And so the way I check myself in part, this is just a couple examples, but if I find myself drifting away from that service mindset of I'm here to, to be a caretaker of this, this franchise, that means that's way bigger than, than me, like means a lot to way more people than just, just me. And if I'm drifting away from understanding the player truth, like what they really feel about the game, then I'm on the wrong path. So mechanically, tactically, this means that I, spend a lot of time looking at key insights, user research, telemetry, social sentiment, really trying to keep my brain wrapped around what, what players are, are doing and what they want, because that's a source of accountability, right? Yeah. Um, you've got objective and subjective accountability that lies in that set of, set of insights. So that helps, helps check me. Um, when I find myself um, pushing for something or having a tough conversation with someone where it's clear that the reason why we might be wanting to do something um, isn't in that service mindset, like isn't isn't here to go after clear business goals or very clearly stated experiential goals that we can back up with with insights. Um, that's where I where accountability comes in, and I'm able to say, well, hold, hold on, hold on a second. Like, 
I understand you're passionate about that and that's something you want to do. But let's just take a step back here and ask ourselves, like, what is our goal? Um, like, what, like what, what do players think about this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think um, really, I guess what I'm saying, Ted, also is I try, I try really, really hard not to hold people to a different standard than I hold myself. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of being a, I don't know, leader that has credibility and, and, and integrity and just just shows up every day doing their best to to serve serve the business, serve the players, serve this serve this franchise. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, again, this is a this is a really healthy life conversation, Ted. I, I appreciate it. Um, <laughs> but, but, I, but I mean, everything I say, like this is this is stuff I think a lot about every every day. Yeah. For sure. Well, I, I love I love though that you use the player experience as an arbiter, right? Yeah. As as a as a objective metric for making decisions because that that is sort of why we do this right yeah. and that's a, i think that's great advice for any creative leader because we all love our ideas and everybody on the team loves their ideas and man it is so hard sometimes to sift through what the most important thing is but then if you boil it down to what you said it's pretty clear right yeah yeah and I mean, to be to be extra extra, extra clear because this is another big topic conversation too like well what about what about individual agency? What about design intent? Like, what about personal preference? What about all these things? Like, we're creative people. We make games together. Like, we we came here to, to build, right? And we're passionate about certain things. I think my my response to uh, that when I hear it coming from my own brain or from other people is, yeah, absolutely. Like, that's where that's where it starts. However, all of that needs to go through some set of checks. Like, we have to gut check ourselves. Yeah. And um, I'll give you an example with, with user research feedback. When we get user research feedback, I always counsel people, look, there are two good responses to user feedback, user research feedback. One of those responses is, yep, we totally agree with that point of view. And we're going to do exactly what this set of recommendations. We have a contractor in our house today, so hopefully you're not hearing banging noises. We're going to go exactly with the set of recommendations that they that they've given us. Yes, we agree and commit. Or no, like we we hear you, we don't agree with that recommendation, but here's what we're going to do instead. Like we we hear the point that they're making, but we don't actually want to do exactly what's being suggested, our design intent to this, we're, we're passionate about X, Y, and Z. But it all goes back to accountability by saying either yes or no, you're making yourself accountable for, for your decisions. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm always kind of uncomfortable about boiling things down to singular words, but sure. I think that accountability as a designer is really important. Like, a, especially as a senior level, I mean, I'd love to talk to other senior leaders about this, you included, but like, if you can't hold yourself accountable to your players, like, why are you, why are you doing this job? Like you, you shouldn't have this job. I don't think if you're not fundamentally the voice of players and you can disagree, but you've got to be able to put, you know, your butt on the line and say, okay, I actually disagree with you. Here, here's what we're going to do instead. Like I, I hear your point, but here's our, here's the way we're going to solve it. We're not going to solve it exactly the way you suggested, but we're going to solve it this, this other way. But I don't think it's acceptable as a leader to hear a valid pain point from a player or anybody else and just say like, nah, that's not valid. I was going to do this instead. You, you know what I mean? And so I, I, totally I, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. It is often, it's, yeah. it's certainly the easy way out. And yeah. there are lots of great excuses for saying that, mm -hmm. one of which is always time. Well, we don't have time to address yeah. it. Yeah. But but then what you, re you release a game that players don't like, and that's a problem. Yeah. Which is a whole different set of accountability, right? Like yeah. that's, that's, that's the ultimate accountability. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, prior, you had mentioned taking a break, right? You, you yeah. took some time off and you came back. And I, I, I actually would love to talk about that period, about... When you came back to Halo Infinite, the game, I think, had been announced and yeah. you, you had gotten the, the team had gotten some feedback. Players weren't yep. particularly happy. What were some of the hardest realizations that the team had to face at that point after the initial announcement? Um, well, some of them, I think, were pretty straightforward and that we've talked about openly before, one of which was just um, expectations people had about a next gen Halo mm. and its uh and it's visual presentation. Yeah. You know, people looked at the visual presentation, just said, 
I get that you guys are going after this sort of cool going back to your roots, like that original Halo style. But what about the lighting? Like, what about, you know, what about the visual effects? What about character animation? These don't seem, these don't seem cutting edge, next gen, AAA, Xbox first party. You know, people use a lot of different words, but they, they really looked at that demo that we, that we made. Um, they saw the open world investment and thought, oh man, that's, that's, that's great for Halo. We love that. But yeah. the visual presentation, we definitely had to reckon with that set of just tough, tough feedback about the gap between what we were able to deliver for that demo and what, and what expectations were for, for a next gen Halo game. Um, the other lesson, I guess, or thing that really hit me when I, when I jumped in was a lot about we we'd made this open world investment or semi open world investment because Halo Infinite still has these linear linear sequences, very much traditional Halo style missions. Um, but when you make a big world, um, you know um, there are also expectations about the variety in that world when it comes to biomes, mm. um, when it comes to a mission variety. And for us, that variety was just missing at that at that point. You know that same Halo sandbox feel was there. In fact, I think this is probably the best or one of the best feeling Halo sandboxes that we've ever shipped in Halo Infinite. It's just super tight and, and focused, but the variety was the variety was missing. And so we spent a lot of time going in and, and tackling that as well. Um, and the big one was, uh, you mentioned it before, like time. You know, we just assessed where we were and realized we're not gonna get where we need to be in terms of where we want to be personally and where players expect us to be in the time that we have that we have allotted to us right now. So that was the other big the other big effort was to work with Bonnie Ross, our studio head, um, and work with all of Xbox leadership to to carve out that extra time to really go after, to make a case for why we should give get permission to go and do that, uh, show the benefit of it and then and then go after it. But you know, that really was a pretty significant move, a very significant move for the team that at that point was locked in on, look, we've got to ship this thing for, for holiday. We, we have this B3 demo and then we're on the glide path to shipping it. Uh, we had to, we had to pivot away from that. Were people generally happy about that decision? Well, uh, people were, I mean, number one, just pretty crestfallen about the reaction, right? Mm. I mean, it's, it's really, it's tough. I mean, uh, you know how it goes. Like when you yeah. get that kind of feedback, it's uh, it's it's really really hard. This is a team that had been working for a really long time, doing really really great work, making a lot of really smart investments in technology and and you name it. And then, you know, you go into that E three with the expectation of like, great, we're going to get that push, we're going to get that lift, and we're going to we're going to let that fuel us into into launch. And that didn't happen. So, um, people were excited about getting more time when that yeah. eventually came in. I think people were ultimately excited about really diving deep into user research um, because the team hadn't done a lot of user research up to that point. And that was one of the the key initiatives that I really pushed on when I came in is, look, in the same way, we just got a whole bunch of painfully very public feedback on this demo that we just shipped. We actually can go to user research and get painful feedback in private. <laughs> and that's really, you know, where we really need to go and, and hear those tough messages. Let's do that privately. And, but let's get that feedback because that'll help us avoid when we launch that same kind of that pain. And so once people started to build muscle around um, user research and, and other kinds of insights, I think the excitement started to build because you can see progress, right? You can get some tough feedback and say, okay, great. We agree and we're going to commit. No, we don't agree. We're going to do something else. And then you retest it and you realize, oh, actually we you move the needle there. People like that a lot more. Okay, let's keep on going. So I think excitement started to build over that that extra year that we got. Uh, but it was, I mean, to not undersell it. It was it was really tough. It was a tough time to to join the team because the team was in a was in a you know pretty demoralized demoralized place. Um, but the good news is, uh, you know, it's it's a great team, super resilient, and the game itself was fundamentally super fun. It was it was a great. Halo game that just needed more time in the oven. That, well, I, certainly, I, I will. I share that opinion. I mean, having played a lot of it, it's a lot mm -hmm. of fun, and I can see too the. I, mean, I remember the announce, and I can see absolutely the changes that went in, and, and how mm -hmm. you all just focused on what matters. And so, what it, with that in mind, given that you had a, a set amount of time and a, and a real, yeah. con, a, a real hard constraint about how much you know time you had before you had to ship. 
what was your technique to prioritization? And I ask this because I think yep. all of us who have to who lead creative teams have this challenge, scoping challenge, nonstop. And I'd love to know if you have a technique that works well for you so that you could share with others. Yeah, I mean, the, the and this is something that I've used before and I think will be familiar with people, but what we wanted to really do is lean into a set of epics, a set of statements, a set of key statements about what needs to be true about the game from the player's point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and we came up with, I think around 10 or 12, I can't remember, but epic top level statements about, you know, experience intent that we could ladder up to, you know, player player experience and then test in user research. Um, things I can't remember the exact statements now, but one of those was really around, um, um, just one that springs to mind right away is, I think this was our number one epic actually, it was something like, as a player, I know how to find and use and enjoy every piece of equipment in the sandbox. Because equipment was one of those things that we really was was new. We we'd had equipment in previous Halo games, but in terms of persistent equipment that you could level up over time, um, that was a that was a new thing for Halo. And we definitely learned from user research early on, like number one, people just aren't finding the equipment. We have it them hidden in the open world. They were not on the linear path at that point. Um, even if people find the equipment, we don't really tutorialize them in terms of how to use it. And even if we tutorialize them in how to use it, the way that we progress the equipment, that whole leveling system was kind of opaque to users. And so this big piece of fun that we could all look at and say, oh my gosh, like once you get the grapple hook and upgrade it, it completely changes the way Halo plays. Mm -hmm. The problem was people didn't really know where to find the grapple hook and how it exactly worked from a UI UX point of view and how to upgrade it. So we created a statement, which was what I said before, like everybody as a player, I should be able to find um, you know how to use, enjoy, and upgrade the equipment, something along those lines. And then we had 10 or so of those statements, covered everything from uh, variety to uh, boss fights to um, you know, graphical presentation. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other epics was something along the lines of, um, as a player, um, the game looks beautiful, runs smoothly, and is stable no matter what platform I choose to play it on. And so that ended up speaking to a whole process of uh, just stability, right? Just stability push and making sure that we, um, even if we had to go to a lower frame rate on a certain platform or the settings were different on a different platform for graphics, that the design experience was consistent. You know, mm -hmm. one of the principles was we are not going to get to performance by removing the number of AI on a certain platform, for example. Mm -hmm. No matter what platform you're on, that design experience should remain consistent. So. These epic statements really became our primary organizing principles on the campaign side of the fence. And we had a slightly different approach on the multiplayer side of the fence. But, you know, there were other things we used as well. But that was, I would say, uh, because leading up to launch, I was more campaign focused. That was our primary lever that we used to really get the team in position to execute in the time that we the time that we had. That That's a fantastic tool. Thank yeah, you oh, for, for sure. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, uh, something you just mentioned was sandbox, and I, I know it was just in, in relation to one of the epics. But uh, op the open world approach is something that, for me as a player, and I'm sure in millions of players, has has been great. So when you were digging into that, when the team had come up with it and was pushing it, and you were deciding how far to go, what were some of the constraints that you considered? How how far did you have to pull things back from sort of the original vision um, on open world? We did. And, you know, I think that, that I know the team went through a lot of iterations on scope and biome variety before uh, I joined the team. And even after I joined the team, we had to make choices about where to where to scale back. Uh, you know, we talked about that uh, ambition for fidelity, right? Yeah. When we just didn't have the uh, the time, the time to go after the level of fidelity across as much variety as we as we wanted to. We made huge strides from the E3 demo to when we shipped the game, but we still had to scale back, you know, make targeted cuts. Um, we didn't end up cutting that much ultimately from the open open world, but I know that from the original designs, there was a there was a pretty significant scaling back of of what the team uh, had hoped at one point that they could they could deliver on. So, uh, but I mean, hey, uh, I think anybody that's tried to crack an open world game, you know, you don't you don't succeed 100% out of the gate on your first 
try, right? You, you build up over time, you, you become better and better, right? Um, you layer systems upon prior learnings and all these kinds of things. And so for us, it was really, um, it was, it was learning on the fly, right? It was, it was building it for the first time. And so yeah. we knew that we needed to, to truly deliver a quality experience, just scope our ambitions to make sure that with the stuff that we did ship, you know, met that, met the expectations. Um, but at the same time, we, we wanted to free ourselves from a lot of the expectations of open world games, which is why we struggled for a long time in terms of how to talk about it in mm -hmm. terms of our marketing promotion, because we didn't want people to get the wrong impression. I mean, we are like an open world game in as much as our game is a lot more open than it used to be. I mean, Halo's always been a relatively open game in terms yeah. of its geometry for a shooter. Um, but for us, we weren't laying on, layering on a whole bunch of systems. You know, we talked a lot about uh, crafting, for example. Um, and I think my probably uh, infamous line for, to the team was something along the lines of like, Master Chief doesn't need to kill animals to make like leather shirts for himself. He's a he's a massive armored super soldier that if he wants something, he goes and like kills it and grabs its gun and then like keep keep on going. He's not he doesn't need to like gather around a campfire and and like cook food in order to like replenish his health. He has a recharging energy shield that that takes care of that for him. Now, I say this with a lot of love for open world experiences and games with crafting in them. This is not me complaining about that at all. I was just trying to explain to the team in a somewhat humorous way, I hope, like, remember, we're Halo. Like we're hate we're a Halo open world game. And that means that it's really all about that moment to moment, most powerful actor in this rich physical simulation being a scavenger on the battlefield, encounter setups, the fun of creating tactics, going in, changing your plans on the fly, like all those things that are a Halo game, plus equipment now and increased mobility with the grapple hook. Let's let's embrace those systems, those emergent first-person shooter gameplay systems. Mm -hmm. The other systems that sometimes come with open world games, that's just not for us. So let's not lose focus and and spend too much time in that in that area. Since the beginning, Halo was about Master Chief and Cortana, partners protecting humanity. But that is now a distant memory. Humanity is fighting for survival. The banished have risen, defeated our heroes, and taken control of the mysterious Zeta Halo. We need a savior. We need hope. We need Spartan 117. Master Chief. We have a new mission, soldier. What is it? What's down there? A weapon. A weapon? How many guns do you need? In the biggest campaign to date, Halo Infinite invites players to become Master Chief and discover true Spartan freedom in the most wide open and adventure-filled Halo experience yet. But Chief won't be alone on the journey. His first mission is to retrieve a new AI, codenamed The Weapon. It's been six months, where have you been? Following the events of Halo 5, Master Chief is searching for the answer to a troubling question. What happened to Cortana? I was created to lock down Cortana, but I don't know why. What did she do that was so wrong? That makes sense. And I, I, I do appreciate the, I'll call it the, the pr light progressions that you have yep. in the game, which is great. It's just enough to keep me as a player ex feeling like I'm, I have a, there's a different experience, different but familiar. Mm -hmm. And and sort of with that in mind, uh, I know one of the challenges that our team at Insomniac has faced mm -hmm. is the balance between Golden Path and open world activities. Yeah. And I know we have the pendulum for us during development swings back and forth pretty frequently in yeah. terms of where players are being drawn to. Mm -hmm. And with a, you have a strong dedication to the Golden Path in Halo Infinite. I mean, the story yeah. is really important. And so... Well, the story drives you along for sure, right? And so where did you have to make decisions along the way to try to move the the focus? 
Yeah, I mean, one of those one of those choices we had to make as we were putting together those epic statements and feeling and um, really organizing around how we're going to double down in certain areas and not others was exactly this balance that you're that you're talking about. So, one of the things that you may notice that are that's different in Halo Infinite versus uh, previous Halo games is when and where you find Marines hmm. uh, to accompany you throughout the throughout the environment. I believe it's true. I think this is absolutely true, but there are no Marines really in our linear content in Halo Infinite, certainly not in the dungeon content. In previous Halo games, you might spend a lot of time with squads of Marines pretty much throughout the experience, or it didn't really matter uh, where you were, a more open space or an interior space. Like being with Marine companions was was just a part of Halo. They could show up pretty much pretty much anywhere. This time around, we were very focused in using Marines as part of the open world sections specifically where we really wanted to make those moments and times that you spent with Marines part of filling out the life of the open open world mm. to give you a you know give you a reason to keep exploring and discovering lost squads and helping Marines out of a jam and piling them all into your vehicle and uh, but we wanted that to be a really focus that on on the open open world so that's just one example of how we I think took what you usually associate with kind of a golden path halo key halo bit which is spending time with Marines um, and really said, let's not, let's not try to, because it was hard enough to go after like the linear content and make that, make that feel good. Let's not overcomplicate that with more, more Marines, with more of that kind of experience. Let's really, really focus that in on the, on the open world. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we, we know we still wanted to tell a great epic Halo story. Um, we wanted to double down on a more intimate style of storytelling, really focus in on a tighter relationship with smaller characters. Um, we achieved that through a variety of ways, including just camera direction. Like we always kept that that feeling of flow and and tight um, intimacy in our storytelling. Um, and that made us want to make moments where you felt a little lonelier, um, a little more dependent on a smaller group of people. And that really was the story of our linear golden path experience. And so for a variety of reasons, it just didn't make sense to keep that same style of, you know, Marine engagement with you. I'm just picking on this one example to hopefully describe what I'm talking about, but we, to make a long story short, definitely made a conscious choice to say these elements that you associate with Halo, we're really going to double down open world for those. And these elements of Halo, we're really going to try to stay focused on the linear campaign in order to give it as much of that hmm. like epic um, sort of linear momentum that you want from that kind of experience. But we don't want to put that same pressure on the player when they're out just exploring and enjoying themselves. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I definitely feel, I didn't consciously realize that playing it, but now it yeah. totally makes sense. It's, yeah. It's, uh, so one thing that is consistent for sure between open world and golden path is combat, right? I mean, yeah. this is combat is sort of, to me, the heart and soul of Halo. And I do remember a couple decades ago, sitting with Insomniacs around a CRT playing mm -hmm. Halo and going, how, how are they making it feel so good? And I remember Brian Hastings, who's our chief creative strategist, would he analyzed your combat and he was pointing out how you guys use bracketing to keep the player constantly you know, feeling tense, but you do it so well and is there sort of a rule set or mantra that you all have used from game to game to ensure that it feels just as good from Halo Combat Evolved to Halo Infinite? There have been a variety of, you know, design documents and, you know, ways that we've tried to codify this over the, over the years. Um, we currently have something we call the Combat Doctrine inside the studio that really lays out a set of clear, a set of clear mm -hmm. principles. Um, but one of those things, I'll just give you a couple examples. Well, I'll, I'll set that aside and just say there are design principles that we codify into this, you know, combat doctrine. But then there's just the work that we've done over the years, whether it's aim assist or magnetism or, you know, in the early days, just spending a ton of time on controller, working closely with the Xbox hardware team to just nail that responsiveness mm -hmm. that we that we needed that all over time have evolved into that you know, feeling that is, that is Halo. We have very specific physics. We have very specific like player, player movement. Um, but I think one principle that's really interesting to talk about is that we have always embraced this idea of just choice. Mm -hmm. Like we, we 
have very few situations where we're going to lock you into a specific style of, of play. Um, we're going to suggest that it might be good to jump into a scorpion tank at this moment in the game, but we're not going to require you to use a certain part of our sandbox to succeed, or at least the moments when we do that, we're very, very intentional about, about wanting to do those kinds of things. So Halo has always been this game about scavenging and building your tool set as you go as you go along. Like combat, we always want to feel improvisational. We want it to feel uh, reactive. We want to give players the opportunity to express a sense of, of, of style and, and their own personal way of playing. Um, I actually remember working with, with all of you um, on Sunset Overdrive and feeling like there was a kinship there because some of those same principles um, felt at work there as well. Like it was yeah. really about expression and giving players that that choice and that freedom and that and that agency and you know a wide variety of, of weapons right to be able to express yourself with your with your own kind of play style i think that's you know one of those fundamental things about about halo that's always that's always been true yeah it, it is uh, well it's, it's good to hear i mean i i hope maybe the doctrine is published somewhere but it is i'll share that there is such an interesting balance between to me, at least between the, the shield, Master Chief's health, uh, the yeah. combat layouts in particular, yeah. uh, the enemy behaviors, and and of course the weapons, and it's it always feels like you're giving me just enough rope to mm -hmm. to yep. screw my to get let me get in yeah. trouble, but then you let me recover yep. unless I'm being really yeah. stupid. That's that's key to it as well. I mean, we never um, back in the early days we talked a lot about death penalty and how we want to you know when you. When you have a player as powerful as the Master Chief, and, you know sometimes it's very hard to actually put <laughs> meaningful blocks in front of the, the player character. Um, that's where difficulty levels and all that come in, come into play. But you're absolutely right. We a foundational principle of Halo is even in the heat of combat, you should have wiggle room. Even in the heat of combat, it should never be so lethal. You should unless you elect to be on legendary, and that's what you're choosing to be is hyper lethal. But you should let the player in a normal playthrough be able to, from a distance, assess the encounter, give them time to say, here's how I want to prepare to engage with that setup. Let them jump in and give them survivability so that they can change their approach in mid, in mid combat. The recharging energy shield is one of those examples. Um, really making sure that cover is a big part of our gameplay, like geometry is gameplay in a yeah. Halo game. Um, making sure a, our AI is vocal and gives you cues that let you know their intentions, let you know when they're retreating, let you know when they have line of sight to your position. All these things are part of letting players in mid combat realize, oops, like what I thought was going to succeed isn't going to succeed, or actually what I'm doing, I need to double down on because it's working really well. But that's, that is a key part of Halo. You should never feel like you're so deep that your only choice is to die and then try it again. Um, that's that's always been true about about Halo games for sure. Oh, that that seems to be at one of the keys to its long term success, right? I mean, it makes the game so accessible. It doesn't ever feel to me that I'm just not a good enough player. Yeah. And I, there are many games that I play where I feel like I'm just not good enough. I'm just getting my ass kicked so frequently that it's just not fun anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, I appreciate that. And I hope, I hope designers, combat designers are, are listening to this <laughs> because it's really, I think you probably encounter this on your own team too. When we're designing something, we tend to go way overboard because we're designing it for ourselves and we're really good at what we're yeah. designing. Yeah. It's, I mean, we've had conversations on the Halo team. Of course, I think all teams have this over the years where you, you'll play a different kind of game, right? And you'll play a kind of game that's, that's come out, that's, really new and that's that's super successful right and i think as a designer you're like oh well God, clearly what they're doing is like yeah people seem to love that we should totally introduce this and in, this into the mix and we often have conversations as i'm sure we all do as you know, game makers like well, wait a minute hold on like is that true to the for what halo is yeah like is what you're describing actually does it make sense for halo in some cases it might like the introduction of sprint where you realize that's interesting. Like the first person shooter industry is moving in a different way. People respond to this in a certain way. And I look, I know Sprint is super controversial among Halo, Halo fans, but for us, it was more about, does this actually add to that feeling of being a 
powerful actor in this physical simulation give you more choice, give you that ability to get out of a situation that you you didn't quite plan for. It seemed to tick a lot of those experiential boxes for us. So we so we jumped in and adopted that. But but yeah, it's always this push and pull of well, wait a minute, just because that game is let's say hyper punishing and it's death penalty, um, is that is that really what we is that Halo? And in, in a lot of those cases, the answer is like, no, actually, that's not the kind of game that we're making. That's not that doesn't work for the kind of game that we want to play. And I, I agree with you that that welcoming, um, what do we call it, uh, volitional uh, like punishment, where if you want to uh, like sign up for legendary, go like go nuts. If you want to turn all the skulls on and like make this game brutally hard, we give you that choice. Yeah. But that's not the default. That's not that's not our entry point for most players. Yeah, that's all that's all volitional. Yeah. Well, that all gets turned upside down. I wouldn't say all of it, but it does get changed a little bit in multiplayer, right? Because now we're talking about skill. Yeah. And uh and so I do want to talk a little bit about your where Halo Infinite yeah. has gone. And you know, one thing I really didn't expect was free to play Halo. Yeah. That that yeah. must have been a long and interesting conversation uh it was uh to be honest that conversation happened before i joined the team so when i joined free to play was already a uh, a choice a choice that had been made and um but yeah like what where do you want to go with this question because there are a lot of different things to talk about when you enter into the free to play world for for sure well what were some of the expectations that you assume what well, some of some of assumptions you made early on about the what was necessary to deliver for a free to play halo game that, yeah gotcha so one thing we hoped for and i guess i'll say expected as as well uh, because because it was halo because it was going to be on game pass because it was free to play is that we would get a lot more new players than we ever had before and indeed we we did we got millions of people mm -hmm. who'd never touched a halo game before um because it was because it was free and so we realized or we planned for uh, making sure that when people jump into Halo multiplayer, that they have the opportunity to, to learn. I think I said something like fail in private or make mistakes in private with user research, like the same, the same way before we required players to step into a match made game with other humans, we wanted to make sure that there were tutorials, the ability to play against bots, um, which is a first for Halo, for the Halo Infinite. We now have bots for the first time in multiplayer. So now that the game has been out for a while and you've been supporting the live services side of the game. What's been the biggest challenge in supporting the game post-launch? And I'm asking, and before you answer, I really am asking this on behalf yeah. of all live services teams, hoping that you can provide some advice about what to do and what not to do to have a sustainable game. Yeah. Um, for us, it all comes back to the challenge that we have as a studio trying to ship a lot of different things. You know, Halo comes with really big expectations, historical expectations about a, what a Halo game is. You know, a Halo game is a great epic single player campaign, but it's also one you can play with friends. Um, epic Halo is a you know multiplayer game. Um, and now we've added on free to play. Uh, Halo comes with Forge. Well, where's our UGC content? Um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the team, for a variety of reasons, had challenges leading up to launch to ship all of those things on, on day one. We just weren't able to put the level of quality across the board to ship everything on day one. So since launch, we've been slowly getting up to speed and shipping our commitments, right? We have committed yeah. to shipping Forge. We're, we're going to ship Forge. Uh, we've committed to campaign co-op. We're going to ship campaign co-op. We're trying to do those things at the same time as we're trying to sustain a uh, live service and also a free to play live service, which brings its own, you know, expectations. Uh, you know, there are a lot of games that people can play now for free. Uh, there are a lot of ways you can spend your time. And, uh, you know, we are, we're learning as we go, like how to get stable and uh, predictable in our, in our rhythm for people. So, yeah, I mean, that's really been, I think the fundamental challenge of our live service is not the live service itself. If that was the only thing we were focused on is just a free to play multiplayer experience, that would be much more straightforward and we would have fewer pain points. It's 
the legacy of of, of Halo and the, the set of expectations that comes along with delivering a Halo game, we're doing all of that as well as trying to really get into a free to play live service for the first for the first time. And that that is the the bottleneck for us right now. You know, we're a big team, but we're not a gigantic team. You know, we don't have infinite resources, despite the name of our game. Like we have to make targeted choices, right? Um, and so that I really think is the is the sticking point for us when it comes to our live service is how do we how do we focus in, um, ship our commitments, and then devote even more focus toward our live service. Um, and we're, we're actually making really great progress in those areas, but that's the tough thing. So I guess if I were to frame it in terms of like, how can, you know, all of us developers learn from this experience? It's, uh, yeah, I mean, live live service, like like everything else, like it requires real real dedication, real real focus. And the, the danger is if you're trying to do multiple things at once equally well, it just compounds the compounds the problem, compounds the challenge for sure. Well, with that in mind, uh, I do want to talk a little bit about culture. With yeah. a live services game and the need to support it and, and all the things you're doing, and including your commitments to campaign, because campaign co-op is super exciting. The fact that that's coming yeah. is great. How do you create a sustainable environment for, yeah. for especially for the live services team? Yeah. Um, and I hate to sound like a broken record here, but the, you know, you, you got to get into a place where you're not trying to get your live team to do too much. You know, our, our, if we just think about, um, our test team, for example, you know, really that backbone of a game development team and, um, our same test team and not the same exact testers, but our, our whole test org needs to look at everything that we, that we do. If we're pushing multiple releases through the test team that we want to get out, it just adds burden and stress. If we, uh, you know, aren't making tough choices to reduce scope and we're just asking people to do more and more and more, you're going to, you're going to burn out a team, um, even a great experienced test team or any team real, real quick. And so culturally speaking, what we've really had to, to embrace, and this is really hard when you're Halo and you're, the expectations are sky high and you've got a hungry fan base that always wants wants you to live up to your past and and deliver more you still have to decide to do less you have to decide to make painful cuts sometimes it's outright cuts sometimes it comes in the form of delays uh, and that's that's hard for culture too because as I'm sure people who've been paying attention you know our our fans are are not in the best frame of mind right now with delays and the fact that we missed co-op at launch and the forge still hasn't come out you know they they're rightly upset about the gaps in our service um they're they're grumpy about not having enough maps and i don't mean grumpy in a dismissive way i mean they're generally upset that we haven't been able to deliver on this this expectation and this and this promise and that that puts additional strain on the team as well the answer for us has been it would be a mistake to try to do unnatural things to go after all of this stuff and to try to run a sprint and burn out the team. If if we want to succeed here, we've got to get in marathon mode, slow our pace, be much more focused about where we're investing and and do our best to take care of each other because we can't, we're not going to survive this if we don't get into a different way of operating. Um, you know, I mean, these are all things I think, as, you know, we, we know this as game developers, right? We know the dangers of crunch. We know the dangers of being overcommitted. We know, we know all these things, but I think when you get into a live service mode and that temperature starts to turn up from the feedback you're getting from your fans, you really got to fight that natural impulse to just, they're really upset. Like we've got these goals. Like what about revenue? What about engagement? Like we got to go, go, go. I, it's it's hard to resist and it's harder to take that long view and slow down i've just been really proud of not just the team for holding ourselves accountable you know people speaking up and saying hey this is wrong like this is causing these problems um to all the way up to our xbox leadership team you know phil and matt and bonnie like understanding what it takes to stand up a service and you know being there to support us as we as we learn and and grow this muscle it's it's i mean I don't know. I mean, Ted, you tell me, but like, I don't, I don't know if there's tougher stuff than, than 
doing live service games these days in the game world. Like it's, it's really, really hard, even for super experienced teams that have done it before. And when you're doing it for the first time, really in a free to play world, I mean, it's, it's rough. It's, it's really, really tough. So we're, we're learning as we go. Well, I, I love what you said. I mean, putting the team's health first, slowing yeah. down, right. Despite the pressures that the players yeah. are uh, levying. It's that's great. And I, I also, I want to applaud you, not just for that, but for being very transparent with the players too. You all have yeah. your team, you and, and the team have gone out there and you said, this is the way it is. This is what we're delivering. It's coming out here. We know that you're unhappy, but here's why yeah. this is being delivered when it's being delivered. That's great. And yeah. I, um, do you feel like that transparent and approach and that accountable holding yourselves accountable has uh, is a win for players? Do you feel players recognize that, or do you feel like it's not as recognized as it should be? Um, I think that um, yeah, it's funny. This is one of those going back to our original conversations. Like when you put yourself in that. It's like I, I am a steward of the franchise here to serve everyday mindset where you really try to put yourself in players' shoes. Your answer is a lot different because players, at least my answer is, players have no sense of what it takes to ship a feature or what your production pain points are or anything about the culture in your studio. Their, their experience is like the truth is in the software for them. The truth is always in like what they sit down and play yeah. and what they can glean from social sentiment and, and things that are out there in the, in the, in the world. And so when you put that lens on it, um, like it's, 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 I think our only real option is to be open and honest with players and any sort of dissembling you do or anything you try to do to really explain Oh, well, you know, here are our pain points. It just, I, it's not that I don't think people listen. It's just, it's not that software truth. It's not that, it's not what they can hear from their friends. It's not, um, it's, it's, it, you want, you want players to be proud of being a Halo fan and to talk to their friends about it. And when you're not enabling them, when you make it hard to be a fan, when you make it hard for them to be an advocate for you, um, I get that. I get that as a player, you know, I, I, and so I think, what I'm really struggling to say is that the um, the way that we're approaching this now, like I said, is to truly try to understand as best we can the real pain points from a player's point of view, be honest with them about what we're going to be able to do, and try to shield them from as much of the internal sausage making as we have to adjust our plans and, you know, do all the sort of stuff day-to-day -day basis as we do as game developers. Like there's, there's a certain amount of oversharing that you can do that I think is even more disruptive. And so we have to, as open and honest as we try to be, we also try to pick our, pick our moments and pick our time to engage with the, when the community, when we feel like we can actually back up what we're going to tell you, even if it's a hard message. Um, but it's, but, but it's challenging. I mean, the, it's one of those, um, one of those unique things about working for for Halo that there's a it's been around for a long time a lot of different fans a lot of different fans of specific Halo games and they're just all these different parts of subcultures within our within our community it's it is a it is a challenging space to navigate but I go back to simple principles be honest like show up and be clear um, deliver hard messages um, and then just do the work like, and remember you're here to serve. Remember that, that is, that is your job. Like this thing is bigger than you. Let's just stay healthy. Let's scout, look out for each other. Um, try not to do too much focus, like let's get the job, get the job done. So it's, yeah, it's, but it is a challenge. It is a, it is a very interesting time to be part of the Halo team for sure. Oh, well, I love it. I, that's again, fantastic statements, great advice for any development team who is tackling live services or going to be yeah. tackling live services. So thank you yeah. for sharing that. And, and something else you just mentioned is the sort of the, the, the breadth and the variety of, of Halo fans. And obviously that's growing because yeah. of your transmedia efforts. And I just want to mention the TV show briefly because sure. it's, it's so cool that you all have jumped into this and, and uh, knowing Kiki, she's actually been on the show. It was great talking okay. to her. Yeah. Uh, I think it was prior to, I think she was in the middle of working on the show when she came on the Game Maker's Notebook. And now for me as a viewer, having watched 
the most of the first season, it's been really fun just to see the connections and get a different perspective on Master Chief and the universe. So with that in mind, and you may not be able to answer this, yeah. would you like to see more crossover between the show and, and how it's portraying characters and what shows up in the upcoming content for Halo? Well, first of all, I, I agree. I you know, spent a good amount of time in my previous Halo life trying to get uh, you know Halo film off the ground and trying to really get um, yeah the transmedia part of the business uh, running. And I think Kiki's amazing. She does incredible work. I'm so happy that you know we finally landed. Uh, that we know we've done other um, transmedia work that's also awesome. But the Paramount show is is very special. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And for me, what made it super enjoyable was that lots of reasons, but one of those reasons was it, it wasn't the game. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, it was, um, it was canon, but it was like canon, uh, that wasn't the Halo Infinite story that we were, we were telling. Um, and so part of that flexibility that is, is, um, is what makes the TV show so special that they're able to do things that we would have a hard time doing or that don't necessarily fall exactly in line with where we want to take that mainline Master Chief story in the games. And so for me, actually, I guess, while it's certainly super fun to think about ways to bring in iconography and bring in characters from the show into our free-to-play multiplayer experience in terms of like customization opportunities for player expression, all of that's wonderful. But I actually really like that there's there is distance between the two because that frees us up to do to do things that are right for for those experiences, mm -hmm. you know, a similar sort of approach. I think for a, a lot of the you know franchise work that we that we do, we want to make sure that whether we're writing a great a great new book or whatever it might be, that we give that creative team or that author that white space, that freedom to go and explore and to tell their own version of the Halo story. And I really like that the television show, in many ways, does that. Like there's a super talented creative team and Kiki you know, work with them to really find a, find a space inside of the universe to tell, to tell their, their version of a Master Chief story to go after their specific goals for, for audience and the kind of thing they want to do. So we're always going to keep a mind to how can we, how can we weave these things together? But I, but I kind of like actually that <laughs> it wouldn't make sense for certain aspects of that show to show up in the game. Um, I actually think that's a positive thing in some ways, again, because it provides that, that freedom for people to go after to go after and do their own thing. I, I will say, like Ted, one of my real joys working in Halo for over the years has been meeting new people who love the game, who aren't game makers, who want to tell a Halo story. And I learned really early on that you're going to get the best stories when you give those people constraints, but make those constraints as wide and loose as possible and really carve out a good, safe spot for them to be for them to be free to express whatever they, what Halo means, means to them. Um, that's, that's always been, in my mind, the most successful partnerships that we've had. Uh, when we try to get too like constrained and, and try to tie people into knots, it's, it's never, I won't say never, but usually it doesn't work out as well as, as the opposite. So. Well, you've, you've certainly uh, had plenty of, not just fans, but uh, folks who are maybe not in the games industry contributing, right? Not just in the TV show, but in books. Yep. And I, I got to point out to our listeners that you are a uh, five-star author on <laughs> Amazon with Contact Harvest. I oh, don't know five stars? Really? I haven't checked in a while. I checked yesterday. You have a thousand, what? almost a thousand reviews and you have a five-star oh, average. Wow. Yep. Okay. Oh, phew. Okay, that's, that's good to know. I haven't checked on the while. I honestly am very nervous about checking uh, those kinds of things because here's the thing about writing the book uh, that is the first book I ever wrote. I mean, I'm, I'm a writer, so I hopefully know how to write, but like I never written a novel before. And I knew going into it a couple things. Number one, that I'd never written a novel before, so I was going to learn as I, as I went. Uh, and number two, that regardless of how good a book it was, because it was a Halo book, a good number of people were at least going to read the first 25 to 50 pages. Like a lot of people were going to jump in and read this book. And so I was either going to fail spectacularly in public, or I was going to learn as I go and get a little lucky and write a book that people, that people enjoyed. Um, 
I've never put my brain through a more tiring intellectual <laughs> exercise than writing that book. I think it didn't help that we were shipping Halo 3 and I think my daughter had just been born. So my second child, so that was a really bad year to write a, write a book. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just an example of, um, yeah, I was on the Halo team, so it's a little different, but the same principle applied. I just wanted to make sure that I was giving myself the same constraints and same open space that I would want any creative person to have. Like I, I try to, the rules I apply to myself, I, I make sure I, the rules I apply to other people, I try to make sure I apply to my, myself. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I gave myself a box. I figured out what I wanted to do. And uh, yeah, I, I'm glad, I'm glad it has five stars instead of one star. Cause that again, could have, could have been an option, Ted, <laughs> very, very likely possibility. So yeah. Well, congratulations on, on it. It's, 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 it is awesome to see it up there. And uh, and I, I do want to just conclude by talking a little bit more about writing and, and kind of come back to where you started. Great. Great. Um, what do you think it takes to be a successful writer in games today? Well, maybe my first part of the answer will just be to leave off the in games today part of that. Like, what does it take to be a successful writer? Um, mm -hmm. Many, oh my gosh, many, many things. I think the things I keep coming back to are, and I tell this to uh, professional writers, I tell this to my children when they write, uh, that writing is rewriting. Hmm. Writing is rewriting. You have to commit to, to constantly revising for as much as you're able, whatever it is that you're, that you're going after. Um, your best idea, your first idea is never the best idea. Um, I think a big source of writer's block is people not knowing from moment one that you have to rewrite. And so I think people get, especially writers who are early in their career or um, don't do it every day, like they get stuck in this place where they they freeze up and they think, oh, I, this, this, like, this is it, this is the draft, this is the draft that's gonna go out and I, like, I gotta get it right. And therefore you, you stall out. And so I just encourage myself and all writers just embrace that it's gonna be rewriting it's never going to get good. Start getting good until the third draft. Just like let it, let it fly, let it fly. And for me, with games especially, there's this other component, which is, and keep yourself as loose as possible for as long as possible. Um, you know, you might be writing a linear game. You might be writing a very, you know, story focused experience, but. Don't ever forget, like a player is going to get involved, and they're going to have their own agency, and they're going to have their own, you know, pressure that they put on your put on your story. So, so keep things loose until they have to become tight. Um, because that's the best way I think to work in interactive entertainment is you've got to, don't forget about that interactive part. So if you, if you ball yourself up as a writer and are like, it's gotta be good the first time out. And if anybody touches this, it's going to be terrible. Like that's not, that is not the mindset of a game, a game writer. Um, it's exact, the ex exact opposite mindset that you got to get yourself into. Um, what else? Um, oh, another principle that I, and I mean this sincerely, like, I might be a writer, but everybody on the team is a storyteller. Like the story belongs to all of us. Um, sure, you might be a, a lighter or a visual effects person or a, or a you know, services engineer. Everybody has their, their disciplines, right? Their expertise. If you're a writer, you, you're, you're a good writer. You're good with words. Like you, you know how to put character into dialogue, all these kinds of things. But that doesn't mean you're the only storyteller on the team. Everybody's in this, everybody's in this together. And the more that you can keep yourself open to input and embrace embrace feedback and think about other channels through which to tell the story, be it environmental storytelling or UI UX presentation or audio, whatever it might be, like story belongs to all of us. And so don't 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 try to create a little walled garden where you're the you're the arbiter of good and bad story. That's just I think that's a really dangerous position to put yourself in as a writer and doesn't result in the best experience for sure. Um, I'll pause there because I could I could go on and on about these things from a writer's point of view, but uh, yeah, even though I, I'm not doing as much writing painfully as I used to do um, anymore, I, yeah, still, still am very passionate about that, that particular game discipline. Uh, and I got a lot to say about it. So. <laughs> well, those are all great statements. And I hope that many writers are listening to this podcast and taking notes. Uh, wow. That's great. And, and so I, as somebody just to, to, with one big question for you at the very end here, yeah, somebody who has helped create one of the most enduring franchises in video game history, and it is true, it is one of the most, and you have been instrumental in it. What excites you about the most about Halo as you look ahead? 
And the reason I'm pausing is I can genuinely say there's a lot. There's a lot that I'm really excited about. Um, the most, let's see. Um, I would say the thing that makes me most excited about Halo going into the future is that I feel like month to month, year to year, that the universe keeps expanding. Hmm. And by that, I mean, we sometimes you can see with franchises is that they will get into a rut or they'll, they'll keep retelling the same story over, over and over again. And I think you can have, you can have success there. You know, you can, you can tell, uh, I'm not trying to be critical here, but like you can, you can tell the, you can tell the Batman story, that same Batman origin story, lots and lots and lots of times. And you can always, you can always have bring in new actors and like take a different thematic approach and all these kinds of things. But I do, I would get really, really nervous. And by the way, Batman is my super favorite superhero. So this is not me like beating up on Batman, but, but I think it's a instructive to me to think about a franchise like that. And I think see the, see the potential pitfalls there where um, I think you, for especially for a franchise that's been around for a while, I get nervous when I feel like that possibility horizon is shrinking and that we aren't pushing and we aren't exploring. We aren't trying to create new experiences, unlock new opportunities for players <laughs> where if we were resistant to new kinds of characters or bringing on new creators, then I would start to get very concerned and I'm not, and I'm excited because the exact opposite is happening that we're, we're investing and I, there's certain things of course i can't talk about so i'm trying to be a little wash wishy washy on the details but as i look at the horizon across the board the game experiences the stuff we have planned on the franchise team um i could feel the universe continuing to expand and as we expand bringing in new new players you know free to play is one example of that um you know if you get new players you got to keep them like you there's a lot of things the players can do with their time a lot of you know you got to give people a reason to stay around but we're, we're, we're being ambitious, you know, way back at the beginning of our conversation, that ambition continues to grow. We're not scaling back. We're not retrenching. We're not um, retreading. We're, we're, we're aggressively going after new, broader horizons. And that, that just makes me super, super excited. Um, and one of the big reasons why I'm just so thankful to be back again with the, with the franchise and helping, helping us push. Cause, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of great Halo experiences we can make, and someday uh, I'll be able to talk more in detail about what we're what we're doing. But just just knowing where we're headed, I'm I'm super excited. That is awesome. Well, as a fan, and on behalf of the many many millions of fans out there, thank you, Joseph, for for sharing sharing that and, and everything today. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Ted. That was a lot. Of, that was a lot of fun. I hear my voice going, but trust me, I, I enjoyed having this having this conversation. It was great. Thanks for all the good questions.